Welcome back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Sunday Wire. I'm your host, Patrick Henningsen. We're streaming out live on the alternate current radio network and also at 21stCenturyWire.com. Thank you for rejoining us. And if you're listening on the ACR audio streams, great. We uh, love our listener base. But also, if you want to watch it, we're doing this special simulcast right now on X Twitter platform. We're also streaming out on YouTube. We're also streaming out on a number of other video sharing platforms. So if you're following us on any of those other platforms, Facebook as well on our fan page, you'll be able to see the live stream there as well. Now, before the break, as we mentioned, we have a very special guest we're going to welcome onto the program. He is uh, many things, but uh, first and foremost, right now at this point in time, he is a very influential author and writer. His work is on many different platforms. We're also syndicating his work at 21st Century wire.com his name is julian rose and he's joining us on the live stream right now julian hello how are you hello patrick i'm very well i hope you are too i am i'm good and i really appreciate your time julian there's a bit of a golf in terms of the uh, time zone between us at the moment i'm in uh, phoenix arizona and i know that you're in central europe so yes. uh, we, we got a little bit of a distance between us. I'm so glad that you could make it. And uh, Julian, you know, what prompts this uh, interview here is an article that you wrote. I think you wrote it really especially for the new year. It was really one of those pieces that's just kind of laying out that what you see as the state of the world right now, the state of humanity, the human consciousness and where we are and where we need to go and what are some of the obstacles that are coming uh, in our way it is a really fantastic piece, which we've published up and uh, we've got it up on screen right now. This new year calls for a bold new vision for mankind. That's up at 21st Century Wire. We'll also drop that into the comment section on X Twitter and on our chat room at 21stCenturyWire.com for our Sunderwire listeners there, Julian. But, you know, that's that's the sort of clarion call, as it were, and a great image, by the way, I have to give credit to yes. uh, Greg Ricosi, who is just Excellent. a phenomenal photographer. <laughs> yeah, beautiful image and so yeah. fitting for the piece that you wrote, Julian, here. Now, before you talk about the contents of this article, Julian, for those people who aren't familiar with you, just uh, introduce yourself, um, the things that you've uh, achieved in your life. You are, I'm going to say as well, a, a pioneer in organic farming. And you've been recognized um, by the British uh, establishment as well for your great achievements and developments in that area. But just give yourself um, a little introduction for our, our listeners. Okay. Well, indeed, I, that is um, probably the most, uh, I'm probably most known for my uh, being one of the, one of the first organic farmers in England, actually uh, a leader of this attempt to create a more benign and working with nature form of agriculture. And I started in 1975. At uh, that time, there were just four registered organic farmers with an organization called the Soil Association, which was the leading organic farming group in the UK. Uh, I, before that, incidentally, I'd been involved in acting uh, in experimental theater. And I had been involved with my colleagues in establishing an organization in Brussels, which later moved to Antwerp in Belgium, called the Institute for Creative Development, where we worked particularly with teenage people on a new form of education, a form of education which incorporates drama, movement, expression, music, mostly classical, and learning how to project oneself as a human being with pride and then put on theater productions uh, with these people. This was very important to me, this work. It's what I would have done if I hadn't inherited a farm. But as it was, I inherited the farm and I moved from Belgium back to England uh, and I set it in motion. And actually the extraordinary thing about this for people who can allow their brains to, to absorb this is that what we were working on in theater was the connection between movement, voice, music, and text. And what we were working on in agriculture was the connection between soil, plant, animal, and man. And actually, if you explore that, 
the physics underneath both are the same. It's a holistic way of experiencing life. And life is holistic. Uh, society has done its damnedest to rip that holistic part into many, many thousands of pieces. Hence the great difficulty of being able to converse, express oneself, communicate in, in a way where people respond using holistic thinking and being. But <laughs> this article that the new year calls for a bold new vision for mankind is essentially calling for people to start thinking holistically and to put center stage the issue, which is in many ways uh, platonic. You could say this is a, an updating of Plato's thinking, uh, which is to put truth and justice at the center of everything we're doing the search for truth and justice and the expression of it, instead of being caught in this horrific malaise where there is only a phony form of politics and nobody understands the meaning of truth and justice. They only understand the meaning of an endless stream of lies, unfortunately. So that's really where we are today. And my passion, if you like now, is to try and help people to have this vision, uh, actually in the, in, the, in the article, which I hope people will read, I use the expression a veritocracy. Mm. It's a new word. I didn't invent it, but a colleague of mine did. <laughs> and veritocracy would, would replace uh, democracy, which is, as far as I'm concerned, dead in the water. Veritocracy would come from the Latin word veritas, which means truth. In other words, the pursuit of truth would be the central issue for society. And people need to really hold that idea in their minds and think about it and say, okay, let's put that center in our imagination, in our thinking, in our passion. Because if enough people do, surely we will slowly start shifting the emphasis into this uh, much more holistic and benign uh, form of thinking and form of education for young people that's a that's an important point you, you're you're underlining there, Julian. Is and I'm not alone. You, of course, you've been writing about this. You've been observing this, especially in recent years. This, the sort of the bevy of of lies and lies built on top of a scaffolding of other lies built. On top <laughs> yes, of, and and it brings us to this point where it is just unbelievable how people are twisting and mischaracterizing reality. Um, and it seems to me, I think you kind of hinted at this a minute ago, that what matters isn't the truth. It, what, what seems to matter is power, po politics, and power, and yes. staying, in, staying in power, and whatever yes. it takes to stay in power, what, however you have to contort the truth yes. of the situation to the point now where we've reached a, a, a Julian, dare I say, a biblical crisis, yes. whereby we are watching in the last, let's just take the last three months as an example, we yes. are watching uh, a horror on an industrial scale in, in Gaza yes. that is just like, we're just gaping mouths open. How is this allowed to happen? Nobody's calling for a ceasefire. Yes. There's no call for restraint. I mean, there is from the people, Julian, but yes. not from our, our governments. So speak to that, because I know you talked about this in your article. You, you came out right away at the beginning, and you, yes. you, you established yes. these points, but go ahead. Yes. Well, basically, I, I just like to come back to the point about power and lies, because actually what's happened is if you take away the central heart-led instinct, which is based on feeling, and love and on recognizing that there's a creator in the background of our universe and that we're a splinter of that creation. And if you refuse to see life through that prism and remove it entirely, all you're left with is the material power, money, materialism, uh, fight, because that takes the place of the divine. And that's the battle we've got up ahead of us at the moment. It's not even possible necessarily to use terms which sound overtly religious or particularly overtly spiritual, 
but one has to find a way of getting through to people that they are on a suicidal journey along with the uh, demise of all individuals who are currently suffering genocide in Gaza and, and other parts of the world where many versions of this sort of thing are taking place. So the key issue is to find in oneself that courage, that spark, that heart-led feeling and work from there to get out of the trap because the trap is otherwise set and there's no escape. And there, it, it, it really seems like that for a lot of people. I'm, I'm t I talk to a lot of people uh, out on the street in public, personal, my personal circle of family, work colleagues, people yeah. that I interact with. And when you're talking about these, these issues, uh, Julian, about what's happening in the world, what's happening in our own environment, um, you sometimes run up against, I don't know, it's like an invisible force field that can't be penetrated, like a mental force field where people That's cannot, right. they can't cross over. You can't meet, you know, when no. you, that common ground can't be achieved. It's almost no. like total separation. I mean, I don't know if you feel, or you might have a different way of describing this phenomenon. Well, I think it's fear-based. And what I'm really saying, I'm rather talking on the, on the level of psychology at the moment, because I think one has to delve into psychology to understand it. It's fear. And fear, th there's a fear of what lies on the other side of the denial. It, it may be an ancient fear, which has been based on, on teachings by the church, uh, dogma in various ways, that have led people to believe that they're guilty of something. They're guilty. You're born under the arc of an original sin. And, and if one goes along with all this sort of stuff, one finds that one doesn't dare face that side of oneself, which is pure, which is innocent, which is full of joy and love. One doesn't dare see it because the contrast would be too great. All your world, which you try and hang on to, would collapse. But you could structure it to collapse slowly. It doesn't have to happen all in one shot. People have to have a sense of discipline. People who go on a spiritual journey have to have a discipline. It's going to take most of their lives to arrive at a point where they feel some sense of enlightenment. And it's a discipline, just like anything else is a discipline in life. If you're going to go for quality, if you're going to go for a feeling of achievement, you can't get there by hitting a button. You know, and this is the problem. We live in a smartphone age where everything is achieved by hitting a button instantly. And if you can't get it instantly, people give up. <laughs> yeah. <I> mean, <laughs> on, on, on that topic of religion, I think that fear, that's an important concept, what you're talking yeah. about there. And th in addition to that, Julian, I think. I mean, we can, there's a lot, there's a lot of great allegories and great lessons, epic lessons in religious texts, in, yes. in, in, in Buddhism and in Christianity as well. Uh, the early, uh, the early Buddhism, uh, or the early Buddha was an, was an activist. He was a revolutionary. Yes. He wasn't, yes. uh, he wasn't sitting at home chanting for things to get, but he was out like making the change, <laughs> defending the, uh, the oppressed. And likewise, uh, people will also interpret uh, the life of Jesus Christ as being a, yes. a, a complete rebel and a revolutionary. Yes, but exactly. that's not the popular depiction. No, nope. I mean the church. The church, you know, put its put its hand over that and forced it out of the picture, because the church wants to exercise control. That's all. It, you know, that's what dogma means. Actually, to have a fixed agenda, and everyone must stick within that fixed agenda, or you'll go to hell. It, simple, very simple. And now these terms are couched with more and more sort of simplistic, uh, less fiery language. But it all comes to the same thing. The idea that you can access yourself at the deepest level and access your creator at the deepest level by sitting under a tree or sitting at home or sitting with friends or anywhere. You don't have to go to some building and go to a priest or whatever it might be, you know, all that stuff should have faded away by now. But I think it still plays psychologically quite a role in people's lives because the indoctrination has been so powerful over so long. 
you know, around about 2000 years, really since the demise of Jesus. So that's a huge issue. However, I'm not that pessimistic. I actually notice, and so do you, and I've heard you say it, I do see people changing. And, and I've met more and more people who I can have a, a decent conversation with rather like this one. And I think, you know, the, the expression, the darkest hour is just before dawn. I hold on to that because life's initiations on a personal level sometimes take you into the darkest of dark places. And at the most extreme moment of darkness, you, the light starts to come back again. And when you see that light, it's like you've seen it for the first time. And you're, you're absolutely overjoyed that it exists, that you, it does exist. <laughs> and we may be all going through that uh, collect, on the collective unconscious level, which I actually mentioned in the article, that to appeal to people, you have to be able to appeal to them on the collective unconscious level as well, not just on the intellectual level. So whatever that vision is, that vision of truth and justice, etc., it has to touch something very deep in people. Something we're all longing for, is what I say in the article. We're all longing for. And, and I think uh, one of the things, when you talk about a veritocracy, I, I think it, it's, it's, it's this, things are so out of balance. And this is, this is if, if, I, if I'm in, interpreting this correctly, this is what's needed to redress that balance. It's, it's right. so extremely out of balance that uh, truth and justice need to be brought back to the front. That's and because it is, is just so far out of uh, it's out so far. Of filter. And in fact, you know, maybe, Patrick, this is, this is the point that I was just making, maybe because it's so far out of line. Truth and justice has a, has a potential to get back into the center to get back into the forefront because there's nothing else worth holding on to in the old school. You know, every part of it which refuses to change, which, which settles for the lowest common denominator and lives with the lie, lives with slavery, accepts it, is pacifistic, doesn't think there's anything one can do. And when it gets to the rock bottom in that level, and, and, and this is the way the universe seems to work, then something else starts happening. You know, something else starts breaking through because we're all in movement. The universe is in movement. The universe is still expanding. It's still hungry. It's still exploring. So are we, somewhere inside us, if we would allow it to emerge and take the center ground. Uh, it, this, I think, is the key uh, you know, there's an expression uh, where attention goes, energy flows. I think it's a very good expression. And if we can absorb this issue, it, where attention goes, energy flows. So whatever we keep our mind on for the majority of the time, our energy will go there. And if you're, if you're thinking about, you know, nasty things all the time or worrying about money or whatever it might be, that's where your energy goes. And it doesn't go towards achieving anything positive. It goes only into that great cesspit of negativity, which is holding everyone in a trapped state. And, and is in fact, because it's a vibratory issue and we're partly electronic beings, we're all working on a vibratory level where we connect up with each other vibratory, whether we're together or not together. And because of that, the negative level is attracting the demonic is attracting people to go even more crazy than they have been in the last few years because they're picking up on it and we're contributing to it. So you get a, a playground for the satanic, don't you? No wonder Netanyahu is um, you know, feeling that he's all powerful because a lot of the spirit world, the negative spirit world is on his side and we're allowing it to happen because where our energy, uh, where our attention goes, energy flows. Let's get it right. Let's put truth and justice in that place and see if we can work it forwards into being central in the years to come. And, and I know a lot, you've written a lot over the last couple of years, and I know people have been talking about this for a while. There's different apocalyptic, uh, you know, watermark 
periods yeah. where people are expecting a major change but the great awakening you've yeah. got a lot of work in the waking times you've got a, a lovely ar archive of your writing there oh, as yes. well as on yeah. on your website but the great awakening but not it, it not as a as a point uh not as a a, a, a moment and um a, a, no. a, a, not a collective epiphany but a process yes but that's that, it that process is dependent on the uh, the challenges that are placed before yes. mankind at that time yeah. in history. That's exactly right, Patrick. You I'm glad ahead. you said that because one of the things we're most up against, it, and I'm, you know, I'm following my my spiritual journey, and it's very active, activist orientated. I simply believe in justice, and then when I see injustice done, I'm fired up to try and do something about it. And I consider this organic. I consider this completely natural. But I've come across a very large section of people who claim to be spiritualists who say that, no, 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 my guru says that you shouldn't get involved in acting, action, because you're contributing uh, to the same vibrational problem as the one you're receiving. You're reacting at, instead of uh, meditating and absorbing your the truth message and remaining passive and remaining centered and calm and letting life pass you by uh, because that is under the, under the control of vast, the greater being than you are, and you really have no place trying to intervene. You'll only get yourself into a bigger mess. Now, that is a massive, massive, massive issue today. I mean, there are billions of people who are following gurus who are teaching this. You know, this is absolute scandal. What's happened? They ought to just try and be human and forget all that stuff. Just listen to themselves. When you see someone being knifed, you know, down the road from where you are, in your bedroom window, what are you going to do? Sit down and meditate and say, I wish I hadn't seen that. I had a negative feeling when I saw it. I had, I had a reaction like something, it, it was hurting. So I tried to put it out of my mind. I tried to say to myself, this is not for me. I'm going to stay in my calm place. Now, that's the open door for the end of the of civilization, as far as I'm concerned, because you are allowing, literally, implicitly allowing the, the evil to just do its stuff and claiming that you're on the side of it. You know, you can watch it happen, but it's nothing to do with you. This is a huge, huge issue. And actually, Let's be honest about it. It's not just in the world of people who are following some spiritual path. It's in the world of a lot of people who simply feel their lives are too important in the terms of their careers, their families, their cars, their holidays, their, their wine, to allow themselves to seriously concentrate on something outside that and make a bit of an effort to do something about it. And this is the reason why we're not seeing this intervention in Gaza at this very moment in time. The people, <coughs> people have been hypnotized into a state of, ah, yeah, I see it. I see it on the television. I see it. Every, and I, of course, see Ukraine. Uh, and then there's a terrible thing going on there. And there's been a plane crash there. And, there's a, and I see this every day. And I feel sort of immune to it. And, oh, well, maybe it's a good thing I do, because if I didn't, I'd be in agony. You know, it'd be just terrific. But does it come up in their minds that maybe I could actually step forward and try and do something about this? You know, it all starts with ourselves as individuals. So that fear, that fear that people get, you know, where they, they, they don't want to act, uh, uh, of course, to protect preserve all of the things that the material things that you you just laid out there so that induces a kind of cognitive distance i see this yeah. all the time i'm sure you do as well and the paralysis the paralysis sets the paralysis. in it, it, it's really fear of having to take action i think because with, with knowledge you're then once you understand something and you realize something you're then in a way, there's a kind of a deep pro, pr, a primordial where you're almost duty bound to act, but then this is muting that, this feeling, this well, cognitive yeah. distance, this fear is muffling that, is pressing that down. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that's what I think politics as a kind of a cult, 
uh, yes. and, and, and peer pressure, fear of being in the out group. This is very powerful, very powerful motivator for people, I think. Yes. Yes, indeed. And I mean, in the world of politics, which, of course, we, we feel obliged to follow, uh, because it affects our everyday lives up to a point, at least within this world of politics, the same effort is being made continuously to, to keep away the truth, you know, to fend it off, fend it off, fend it off as much as possible. Because the agenda which governments are working under is actually the agenda of the central cabal um, that are working with dark forces very strongly and have the ambition to have a total controlling influence of the entire planet, if not the universe. And that's where the dark side comes in from outside the spectrum of the planet. But they are working together. And the point there is that we, there are, thank goodness, there are one or two people in government who make a bold effort to get the truth out there. And they're well placed to because up to a point, the institution, at least in England and at the parliament and the constitution, although it's not a written constitution, does demand that someone who's been elected as an MP has the right to speak in the chamber and to call a debate. For instance. So, you know, we've seen examples of exactly that happening in the case of COVID and exposing the excess deaths, etc. Now, that could be going on in every every parliament in the world about Gaza. If enough people had the same guts as our English colleague whose name suddenly gone out of my mind, you know who I'm referring to. Um, <laughs> if everyone, if other parliamentarians in other parts of the world, and including in England, decided to make that the, the, the central issue, then this issue would be forced in front of not only the MPs, but the public as a whole. And the, the newspapers might have, to, might have to report it even. So that's one of the few ways we have, I think, of getting uh, information out. And I sense the frustration. I sense the frustration in people that are desperate for something to be done. You know, this is an un unprecedented level of, of murder and genocide and ethnic cleansing going on. I mean, it's unprecedented. So people are feeling the hearts are bleeding because the great thing about humanity is that actually underneath this, um, this outside veneer of blocking, the heart is operating and people are, people are humanitarian by nature. And we were fond of each other as human beings. And we want to support each other. We want to be together and be happy. Now, all that cannot be denied. What can be denied, it seems, is one's allowing oneself to re-establish contact with that humanitarian side of ourselves and to take action based on that, uh, not hide away and think it's all impossible, it's all too far gone, there's nothing we can do, you know, the end of the world, it's Armageddon. You know. we, we, this light we were talking about at the beginning of this program, emerging at the darkest moment, is not unprecedented in history. And I, I, I hear this as well. Uh, people say, well, it can't get any worse. Uh, than this, it'll sort itself out. Yeah, it's really bad, but it hopefully it's, it'll sort itself out. Th these things have a way of self-correcting. I hear this as well. But history shows us, uh, Julian, that yes, it can get a lot worse. And yeah. especially with the type of technology, the tools that mankind yeah. have, um, I think, I, you know, so if you don't, if you, if you are going to take a passive uh, approach to the horrors that you are witnessing in real time, then you're in a way um, kind of enabling p potential worse things to happen on the on the back of what you're seeing there. Yes. History has borne that out to be the case many times, and yes. I think I think we're in a greater danger in a in an advanced modern technological society. In some ways, Julian, we're in a greater danger of total annihilation. Uh, than previously in history. So this is kind of new territory for mankind. I know we've yeah. litigated this over the Cold War, but this yeah. is different because it technology is, is now so intertwined with our lives now. 
and I think I think this is a different uh, world than the Cold War, the Cold War nuclear Armageddon type paradigm. I don't know if you have any thoughts or. Well, I totally agree with you, Patrick. In fact, this is my other pet theme, which I've been writing about a lot in the last couple of years, which is this uh, techno mechanistic invasion of people's lives with by IT, really, essentially. Uh, in the industrial, military industrial complex, is why a lot of this stuff is born. All of it is based on military. So all of it is about spying, controlling, and befugging people's intelligence. And it's grown very, very fast in the last two years or so, to the extent that we now know the degree to which anyone carrying a smartphone around or something similar to that is completely in the thrall. It actually is completely under the um, invasive forces of electromagnetic energy, for one thing. That is in its own right is extremely dangerous. Secondly, as things become more and more dependent on use of this, in other words, access to your bank account, access to your travel, access to your uh, information that you want to receive from other sources, etc. Everything, because it's convenient, and that's the danger word, folks, convenient. Because it's convenient, you put it all onto this little time bomb in your pocket uh, and you become completely dependent on it. Not only is it damaging your health because it's electromagnetic radiations, especially as they move up the scale into something like 5G or 6G, or whatever we're gonna go next, but, sec but even worse than that is probably what you were referring to really, which is the power that is now available to those who want to do harm via this particular technology is absolutely enormous. You've got so many different avenues which it can come through. It can come through street lights, you know. It can come through various uh, camera arrangements. It can come through the person sitting next to you on a train who's using the mobile, and someone else next to you on the other side is on their laptop, and someone else. Is, so it's it's electro smog, and people are immersed in it. Now the, the danger, of course, in this is that they're immersed in it, uh, not in a positive sense. You could say the amount of information available is huge. You know, you suddenly have access to far more information than you had 10 years ago, 20 years ago. You could look into this. You could use this tool for accessing information which you need in order to understand what action you should take to move your life forward in a positive way and to take action to prevent the guards of war, for instance. You know, there are hundreds of articles, there are small videos, there are some quite brilliantly creative small pieces. You don't even have to have something that lasts more than three minutes to give you the picture if you want to know it. But if you don't want to know it, that little machine is going to devastate your life and your children's lives because it captures you and you feel completely immersed under its control and you are hypnotized by it and you can't give it up. You have to look at it every three minutes to see whether someone sent you an email. I mean, I watch people on the street. They are obsessed by it. And this perfectly suits the control system, who after all is the operative behind the whole thing. You know, the Googles and the Microsofts and all the rest of them, they're, they're just there to enable the control system to carry out its uh, its kill. Yeah, you practice uh, moratorium personally, don't you, on uh, yeah. electronic devices? You, you Not only that, I don't have a mobile phone. I yeah. threw it out 20 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> and I have a moratorium of not turning on the computer on Sundays. Mm. We both do, my wife and I, Jan Viga and I. And, and, you know, we're disciplining ourselves, and that's what I'm trying to explain to people. There's no way out of this if you don't discipline yourself. I mean, I can shout at people till I'm blue in the face. But unless they decide, unless people decide, hey, I've, I've had enough, I've had enough, 
I see that actually, well, I could do something about it. Original idea, I could do something about it. I could take control of my destiny if I took a few steps in that direction and I, I felt better afterwards, I could go on with this in this direction. I could go on and on and on. And that's what one simply has to do. One has to kick off somewhere. So there's 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 science behind this, by the way. I know this is part of your life's work, is this, you know, the interaction between uh, humans and plants, uh, water, plants, the ability to grow, the, the, the to perform under optimal conditions and interference from EMFs and things. These are things that you have studied and experienced your yes. whole life, and you've seen the results of it. Yes. Um, just talk about that because I think you, you've you uh, managed to uh, build uh, some incredible uh, communities around the concept of uh, holistic farming. But well, uh, what have you yeah. learned? What have you learned through that journey, uh, Julian? Well, <laughs> it is an awful lot. I tell you the most important thing you learn, humble, to be humble. When you're farming, hands-on farming, and you're responsible for running a farm with quite a lot of livestock. I had a lot of livestock at the time when I was running my farm in England. I'm still farming here with Jadwiga, but mostly vegetables now. But in my farm in England, I had cows and sheep and pigs and hens. And, and every day, you have to look after those animals. So I had people to work with me eventually as the business started to pick up. I could afford it. But what you really learn is you're actually, you know, your feet are firmly on the ground. There's things you have to achieve every day. Otherwise, some animal will, will, will suffer, will starve or whatever. So you have a duty before anything else in your life to look after those animals and look after the soil of your farm and look after the biodiversity of your farm, the number of species that are growing. And because it's organic farming and you don't have access to chemicals, you particularly have to watch how the land is responding to the way you're treating it. And you have to adjust your treatment if you see that it's not working. This is a 300% full-time job. <laughs> you let, you, you're in it. You can't see anything else when you're fully in it. Um, I learned humble to be humble. And I learned the pleasure, the shared joy of working with nature rather than against nature. I mean, industrial agriculture, monocultures, agrochemical farming is working against nature. Let's, let's be honest. You know, I'm, I support all farmers at the moment because farmers are under enormous pressure. Uh, Klaus Schwab will tell you that he wants to kick all farmers off the land and replace food by insects and, and synthetic laboratory milk and beef, uh, meat and anything else you like, dairy products in general. And he wants it all done by 2035 at the latest. And we're, if we follow the Great Reset and the Fourth Industrial Revolution and the Agenda 20, Agenda 31, what the Agenda 30, sustainable development, as it's called, that's where we're all going to land up. If anyone saw the film The Hunger Games, it, had, it was a very accurate description of this. And that's the plan. And that's the plan. People can read Klaus Schwab's book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution, particularly that one, because he lays it out. He lays it out in, in great detail. Um, and so the point is that that's, um, that in, in, is similar to what we were saying about the psychology of human beings and, and adopting something in their own lives, which is positive. In the farming world, you have to start getting with nature and, and you get so much better results. I mean, immediately I started farming organically. I didn't have to call the vet. I never had to call the vet. And I had 30, eventually 40, eventually 60 dairy cows. And when we were before that, we, we were using more intensive farming techniques. Uh, agrochemicals and, and various veterinary products were part of it. And we had to call the vet usually every two or three weeks. Once I went organic, I never had to call the vet. The cows 
went to the hedgerows and chose the medicine they needed to cure themselves. You know, that's what it means to work with nature. But if you cut the hedgerow, if you cut everything off the hedgerow that looks like it's not nice looking or it's spiky or it's, you're denying these animals of their ability to find their natural medicine. And so it goes on throughout the food chain, you know, right the way through the food chain. And the key in all this is biodiversity, encouraging biodiversity, because nature holds the answers for us, for human medicine, as well as animal medicine, quite obviously. So the more we encourage biodiversity, the more the larder, the larder, the rich larder of pro-ecological, pro-health products is simply growing in front of our very eyes. And then all we have to do is research and remind ourselves of the various medicinal values of these plants. That information is out there, but of course it's got buried by big pharma who desperately wants it all to be banned. Uh, I had to fight a, a, a very tough campaign in England to stop unpasteurized milk being banned. And if you're going to drink milk at all, you should only drink unpasteurized milk. You know, pasteurization, ultra heat treating of milk, homogenization destroys all the goodness in it. So what's the point in having it? You know, you can make your own white stuff and drink it with water. It's better than that mass produced horror. Everything in life is the same. Once you get back to the quality end of it, the real end of it, it's been as untampered with as possible, as natural and as basic as it possibly can be. Then you're getting the full value. And this is a lot of, I, I learned a lot of this through, through my organic farming. And I gained, I was thinking I was going to be involved in the arts, you see. I had a talent for this already when I was at school in acting. And I thought this is the way I was going to express myself. But in the end, fate decided, cosmic Leland decided, that I was going to pour all this passion and artistic uh, focus into the farming. And it gave me an enormous amount of uh, very, very rewarding experience. Yeah, so, and you, I mean, uh, that's a great... Um... There's a great lesson in it. Um, you mentioned the pharmaceutical industry. This is also a really powerful entity uh, on the planet. They they look at agriculture. They've really gone into agriculture in a big way with uh, vaccines and antibiotics for livestock. Um, and it's so, you, and yeah. most farmers feel totally dependent upon upon this. And this is a tragedy because you see. Uh, before the Second World War, almost all farms were, you could call it organic, organic by default. There were a few fertilizers like nitrogen fertilizer around. There were a few preliminary times of pesticides. But the great majority of farmers were organic and practicing rotational agriculture. But after the Second World War, the pharmaceutical industry stepped in and actually the the munitions left over from the Second World War went into creating nitrate fertilizer, explosives, essentially. So this is the, the explosive material necessary to make bombs, etc. It's largely based on nitrates. And this was discovered to be a way of making grass and crops grow around 25 to 30% faster than by using farmyard manure on traditional methods. So farmers started using nitrates, we were told to by the government, I'm actually referring to England, because England started the Industrial Revolution and England led modernization of agriculture ever since. Uh, it demanded after the Second World War, okay, if England's gonna be self-sufficient again in food, you're gonna to have to adopt these modern techniques. And here's one that really works. You don't have to have that stinking stuff called farmyard manure we did you know you can you can abandon that completely you can use nitrate instead and you put that on the land two to three times four times and you will find your grass just rushes up and and so farmers went for it mostly not all <laughs> but the great majority and what happened oh now this is really significant the pests that normally attack crops were 
were when they attacked plants that have been grown using nitrates, they very rapidly caused huge problems. And they were much easier for pests to get in amongst and to cause damage to. While the stems of plants were still strong in their cellular structure, and where the, the energetic ability to protect themselves was still strong, rooted in the soil, pests don't attack them. They, pests can try, but usually the plant wins in the end. It's like us with our immune systems. If we've got a good immune system, we come through. We go through a period where we might be poorly, but we come through. So this is what happened. So then they had to introduce a pesticide because people using nitrate had pest attacks, they had to invent a pesticide. And then the next thing that happened was, oh dear, oh dear, these funguses are getting into these crops. So a fungicide was introduced. Now this is all pharma, big pharma, right? You got it? This is they're introducing a fungicide, synthetic fungicide, because people are having problems with that. Oh, but that's not the end of it. The pests and the fungicide don't seem to be enough. We've got a massive problem with weeds. And so weeds tend to be coming. Oh, so Big Pharma has another great opportunity. We've invented something called a weed killer, you know, something that will destroy all your weeds. You just have to spray it out on to, it's called a herbicide. So what the farmer lands up doing is spending the whole time going across his field, spraying all these different things. And while the crop is growing in the soil, the soil is doing nothing to help that crop survive or to bring nutrients into that crop and produce real food out of the other end. So the food is already synthetic before it's even been harvested. And this is what 90% of Western society is eating every day of their lives via hypermarkets and supermarkets of the world. And, and, and it's leaching into the water supply. Yes. Uh, gr yes. Groundwater table. Yes. So, so, so you're, you're talking from a completely different angle than let's yes. say, how, how is Bill Gates thinking about farming? Cause he seems to want to get into agriculture in a big way uh, <laughs> to move from micro uh, software into mass agriculture is what do you think the flaw in his thinking is in his approach to agriculture how how, how would you describe it <laughs> well i don't know if you <laughs> i'm searching for <laughs> expeditious i'm sure <laughs> you thought looking. about it julian come on okay well never mind yes <laughs> well you know the point is bill gates has has made central to his life the idea of being one of the a big chief control agents, isn't he, you know, of the world. So you know, when you're in that situation, you, you don't understand that this, if there's anything that's getting away from you, there must be something wrong. You know, we have, we should have the ability to control, to be absolutely certain of the results we're going to get, because we can't leave it to nature. Oh, no, no that, that's, that's a disaster area. We, we've moved on. Now we have the ability to control everything. And look what success I made out of um, vaccinating people in sub-Saharan Africa. You know. And look at the success I made out of my Microsoft endeavors, et cetera, et cetera. So now I'm going to move on to, to agriculture. And I'm buying up huge areas of land in, in America and uh, probably elsewhere. And the point there is that I can then experiment with all these synthetic techniques. And I actually... What I'm going to grow there will be possibly something uh, which it might be useful for for uh, energy, maybe, possibly energy, uh, possibly also for building materials. I can grow sort of synthetic forms of grass, etc., which can be very useful and it turned into planks and things like that. But as to growing real food, the real way, that doesn't belong to his textbook at all. One, he, even he must know about organic farming. He must know about these issues. But what he's trying to do is to lay down his prescriptive medicine on agriculture in exactly the same way he's done with his vaccinations and all the rest of it. There is a way of having total control over that system. And if you're going to approach that, 
you must take over and nature must be sidelined. He's in that world. That's that's a good way to describe you, you. I see you've employed some of your Stanislavski methods there in, in playing, <laughs> playing Bill Gates. I think you'd be a good one man show. Julian Rose is Bill Gates, rethinking, <laughs> rethinking, <laughs> rethinking world domination. Um, yeah, well, actors do have to sort of take on the personality of people <laughs> that they don't particularly admire. It's yeah. quite difficult because psychologically, they sometimes get quite caught up in that and can't free themselves again. Yeah, no. Luckily, it's, I it's, think I can free myself from Bill Gates. It's it, that is a that's a legitimate method of trying to figure out where people are coming from by by yes. taking steps in their shoes, point by well, that's point. Right, Patrick, you're spot on there. And in fact, this is you know part of the discipline I learned in in, in acting, and it was very extreme. I, I was involved in some very very radical experimental uh, world in acting, and basically, you have to find in yourself that emotion which you're seeing in someone else and you have to fit, find out where it is in you because we all have it you know very often people say well you know we, we, we're looking for the good thing to get the good thing out but i say no you must also look for the dark side of yourself you must recognize it it's there this is the lights there the dark is there come on you can't get away from that so what is it explore it find out about it how would you express it and that's when you start being able to identify with how other people do murderous and horrible and crazy things. You feel it in yourself. You feel in yourself, I could do that. There's a place in me capable of doing it. And it's very important because once you see that and then have the courage to control it and say, but I'm never going to allow myself to go into that area and make use of that. When will you, you see other people uh, and you talk with other people who have a tendency to drift in that direction, you can spot them very easily because you know in your own self what's going on. You can see it in other people. But if you don't know it in yourself, very often you don't spot it in other people either. Yeah, so, yeah, if you, if you, can, if you can see that, understand that, you're, must, you're, you're less prone to judge yes. and, and more apt to understand, and, and that's... That's the first step to finding yes. some middle ground or solution to to the problem. Yes, um, and, and now you you do get into the world of the great religious, the great spiritual teachers of the world, because they say, you know, and Jesus said, and Buddha said, and, and Krishna said, and, and they all said something on that issue. Is it absolutely central? Which is that there is a place in every human being that connects up with the place in every other being. So whatever you do to others, you do to yourself. If you curse other people, you curse yourself. If you only say what a miserable person that is or how hopeless they are or all the rest of it, that's what you're saying about yourself because we're actually one in the end, in the eyes of the divine, we're one. And therefore, the message that we should be working to, to develop is this as the message which is where, energy, where attention goes, energy flows. And that one brings up an issue is, well, I'm, I'm, if I'm one essentially with everybody else, I, well, one humanity, well, one brotherhood and sisterhood, we all feel the same emotional strains. We all feel the same joy. We all feel the same sadness when someone dies. We all feel that in an acute level. So we're all sharing exactly the same thing. What is, the, what is blocking our communications with each other uh, in saying and agreeing this and therefore on agreeing on an action plan, which is both internal and external. It's both going within Help, helping to unlock the positive side of one's own being and going out to take that positivity into the outside world and make positive things happen. It must be both. It can't be one or the other because that's not the way the universe works. It's dual. It's both. It's male and female, in breath, out breath, darkness, light. It's always both. The inner and the outer are actually one. So, we must get used to thinking about that 
And then I think we will start on a much, much more positive, exciting, fulfilling route in our own lives. And anyone can start at any time. Now is the best time. Yeah, now is the best time. We're at the beginning of a new year, a pivotal year in the human story, I would contend. Uh, and I think I'm not alone in that assessment. Every year is a pivotal year, but I get the feeling so many do that this is extremely pivotal uh, in the uh, development of <laughs> the human race, uh, you could say. There's a new world uh, waiting to be born, but it is a painful delivery. <laughs> and so uh, we, we well have said. to. We have to we have to kind of get ourselves uh, focused, and uh, I want to point people again to this fabulous piece uh, by Julian Rose, which we've uh, have uh, published up at Twenty First Century Wire. This new year calls for a bold new vision for mankind, and that's the kind of thinking I think we need to start engaging with. It's a good time now. Uh, we've got all of the signs, we've got all of the harbingers, all of the signals that this is what needs to happen now. And uh, I want to thank you, Julian Rose for joining us this week uh, this has been a, a great discussion a great conversation i think there's a lot for for everybody here and uh i really appreciate it thank you very much well thank you for having me patrick and also thank you for encouraging such a deep and meaningful conversation on your program no, that's our pleasure. It's uh, it it comes easy with uh, with guests like yourself, Julian, and I hope that uh, we can uh, pick up the threads and hopefully have some updates as to where we are on this continuum uh, in the near future. So I look yes, forward to that. Right. I look forward to that as well. And follow Julian's blog as well. We'll put links uh, to some of his work uh, in the comment threads and in our chat room as well. And I think there's going to be, you're going to find there's something for you uh, in what Julian's writing about. He's really got his finger on the pulse and has done uh, for a very long time. Look, we're going to wrap things up here at the Sunday Wire for this segment. We'll come back in just a few minutes and we'll do some housekeeping here with the alternate current radio and 21st Century Wire. Appreciate you guys. Uh, stay with us. We'll be back in just a few minutes, so stick around, and we'll wrap things up in just a few.